Hi, my name is Jeff Petraka, and I'm the curator of entomology here at the Long Island Aquarium's Butterfly and Insect Zoo. Today, I'm here to talk to you about ants. Ants are amazing little creatures, and it's very easy to look at them and write them off as these little insignificant pests that are not very cool at all, right? But that could not be further from the truth. Ants have some amazing biology, and they're some of the coolest animals out there. So, for example, I have my leafcutter ants right here. Let's take a quick look. So these are leafcutter ants from the rainforests of South America. And these guys are hard at work right now out in the uh, rainforest, or the so-called rainforest. And true to their name, they spend their days cutting leaves. So you can see very clearly some of these ants uh, taking their little leaf cuttings and carrying them. Let's see where they're taking these leaves. So if we were to have followed our little ant friend underground, eventually she would have made it back to her colony. And she would have brought her leaf cutting up here. So check this out. Believe it or not, this is a garden. It's a crop of fungus. So this is a giant gray ball of leaf cuttings over which the ants have planted mushrooms. The mushrooms are digesting the nutrients in the leaves that the ants have collected, and the ants themselves are eating and surviving off of this uh, fungus. So all of the babies, which are buried deep within this gray ball of fungus, um, as well as the adults are eating this, this mush, these essentially crop of mushrooms. Now, these mushrooms cannot survive without the help of the ants, and the ants cannot survive without the help of the fungus without the food of the fungus, I should say. Now, this is pretty amazing. These ants are literally farmers. That's crazy. Who would have thought that an ant could actually farm its own food? And you might say, oh, okay, well, leafcutter ants come from the rainforest. Well, that's cool. A lot of cool stuff comes from the rainforest, but, you know, the ants in my backyard are definitely not that cool. Well, turns out that actually may not be true. Some of the ants in our backyard are just as cool as these leafcutters. Let's check some of those out. And so here we have another type of ant. Now, you might be looking at this and saying to yourself, oh, wow, look, another leafcutter garden. But, you know, you wouldn't necessarily be too far off. They actually, this actually looks very much like the leafcutter gardens that we saw earlier. However, this is a fungus garden that is not built by leafcutter ants. It's actually built by another type of ant known as trache myrmex. And just like the leafcutter ants, the trachea myrmex ants go out into their environment and they find uh, uh, organic material to use as fertilizer to grow their fungus. These guys form very small colonies, however, compar in comparison to the gigantic leafcutter colonies that can number almost a million individuals strong. And believe it or not, you can find these guys in your very own backyards. Believe it or not, this colony that you're looking at here was collected in the pine barrens of Long Island in New York. That's pretty crazy. So we actually have fungus farming ants right around here in the northeastern United States. Now, most of the trachea myrmex ants actually do occur in the tropical regions of the Americas, but uh, these guys are one of the rare exceptions. But it's still pretty cool to, um, to know that they're up here uh, kind of coexisting with us in our own backyards. Let's take a look at another really cool ant species. Now, there are nearly 13,000 species of ants out there, so it's going to be pretty hard for me to talk about too many of them right now. Instead, what I wanted to do was focus on some major different groups of ants that I think best describe the ecological relationships that ants have with their environments, and also that demonstrate many of the different amazing behaviors and adaptations that these ants display in those environments. And what I wanted to start with first are the tenants and trappers. And so what I mean by tenants is the fact that some ants, like this little acacia ant here, will literally act like, almost like tenants in an apartment building with the plants that it lives on, like this acacia tree being the apartment building. So the the acacia ant, for, ants, for example, will spend its days wandering around the acacia tree, feeding on any type of insect or other herbivore that would land on the leaves. And so if it, if, uh, it will go ahead and attack them, and it might use them for food, but at the very least it'll fight them off, which is obviously a good thing for the plant. The plant would want that, right? And so the plant actually encourages the acacia ants to stick around by providing things like this gigantic hollow thorn here, uh, which is known as a domatium. Um, and essentially, it will encourage the ants to live inside the thorn and the branches, uh, and it will even give them food 
in the form of these little fat bodies, fat sugar bodies known as Belgian bodies at the tips of the leaves, the leaflets. It'll also provide extra floral nectars, which will uh, give the ants yet another food source on the tree. Now, these ants take the symbiosis a step further. They'll even walk off of the tree itself and they'll pick up seeds from potential competing plants that would fall too close to the acacia tree's trunk. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Trapper ants do something very similar where they spend time living on a particular plant. The plant has domatia for them to encourage them to stick around and they'll fight off any type of herbivore that might land on the leaves, but they'll build traps a step further. So that's what you're seeing in the image here. Each one of these little, um, little things is a trap and uh, the ant will build this and they'll live inside the trap and they'll wait for a prey item to land on the trap. They'll get its feet stuck in the little holes of the trap and then the ants will jump into action and take it out. Now in so in this way when they group all the traps together these little tiny ants each of each of which are no more than a millimeter or so in size are able to take down a huge prey item like this gigantic horse fly. Now, that's a cool lifestyle, but uh, there are also thieves and conquerors out there. And this one hits a little bit closer to home because both of these examples come from the Eastern United States. And so the thief ant has a, it's a very um, good name for this ant because what it will do is it will build its colony very close to nearby ant colonies. And it will uh, every so often raid those nearby ant colonies for their yummy, uh, innocent little larvae that are, are, are easy targets. They'll go into the, the colony, they'll take the larvae back to their own colony, and they will eat them. And uh, now these guys are scavengers generally, so they'll, they'll eat a whole bunch of different things. But this, this raiding of ant larvae is one of their characteristic traits. And these guys are, by the way, are relatives of, of uh, the fire ant. So, so uh, Solanops and West are relatives of the fire ant, but they are definitely not as aggressive or dangerous as the fire ant. But they do still occur in human uh, developed areas. So you can actually find these guys in New York City, believe it or not, in the medians of roadways. Now, another northeastern ant would be polyurgus, or the so called slave making ant. So these guys take that larva re uh, raiding. Uh, to a new level. So they'll, they'll go to another ant colony, take larva, but instead of actually eating the larva, they'll bring it back to their own colony. They'll let the larva develop into adults, and then they'll use those adults as their own workers to carry out the tasks of their own ant colony. It's pretty, pretty uh, devious. Now, all of these interactions have led ants to become really excellent chemical engineers. So a lot of these guys can manufacture some pretty potent toxins um, for both defense and for taking out prey. And so uh, one of my favorite examples is the bullet ant from, the, from Central America, from the neotropics. The bullet ant is so called because its venom and its sting is so powerful that it's as if, when, as if you're get, you got shot with a gun when you get stung by one of these ants. And these guys are kind of wishy-washy, ironically. They're not like vicious predators. They, they literally are very clumsy ants, and they even will play dead, believe it or not. Um, they're not a very uh, formidable ant, but their sting certainly is. Now, the exploding ant over here on the right doesn't waste time using its, its um, using a venom to sting prey. Instead, what it'll do is it'll use its entire body as a defense mechanism. So when they're threatened, they will explode. They actually crack their body cavity open and this big yellow goo comes out, which is toxic and at the very least distasteful to, to would be predators. And so these guys will explode on attackers to their colony. And in so doing, they will altruistically sacrifice themselves for the good of the colony at large. Now, these are some pretty crazy adaptations. And you know that leads you to believe that a lot of ants actually serve, uh, car uh, live their lives as hunters. And so one of my favorite types of ants uh, right over here on the left is Eseton, the South American army ant. Now army ants, true army ants, are some pretty aggressive hunters. They will literally go out in rainforests and kill everything in their path. So in uh, South America, there's Eseton, but in Africa, there's the so-called African driver ant, Corlis, which looks similar to these guys. And they'll do the same thing. And farmers in Africa will even use the uh, army ant raiding parties as a way of natural pest control. So when one of them is coming into their farms, they'll up and leave for a little bit, and they'll let the ants raid their crops and kill literally everything, or, or at least chase it out of their crops, uh, any potential pests or anything. And 
Now, true army ants, believe it or not, they don't spend their, they don't live, their colony does not exist in a single location. It up and moves around every so often. So once these ants kill every living thing, in a, in a, every animal rather, in a certain area of a rainforest, they will uh, have exhausted their food supply. And so they up and move the entire colony to another location where they have fresh hunting grounds. Weaver ants are also hunters. Now, these guys are kind of like the acacia ants and the trapper ants in a way because they do have a unique relationship with particular types of plants. And but these guys, what they'll do is they'll 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 make their colonies in the leaves of plants that they weave together. And what you're seeing here right now are these ants sort of pulling the uh, pulling these two leaves closer together. And weaver ants use their own larva, believe it or not, as uh, um, uh, to produce silk in order to literally weave, weave two leaves together. And then once they've cupped a leaf and they've, um, they've uh, sewn it together, the, all the, the, the workers will, will, will um, uh, dump all their larva inside of that little cupped leaf for protection. Now, there can be hundreds of these cupped leaves in a single colony of weaver ants on a tree or a group of trees, believe it or not. Now, some of the ants are a little bit less active, but they're more so, more so they're, they're planners. And so these ants prepare for various different shifts in their environment in terms of um, um, being able to make sure that they have food for periods of the year when there may not be food available. And in particular, the honeypot ant is one of the most well-known. So what you're seeing in the image here are what are called replete workers. Now these guys dedicate their entire lives essentially to being food stores for the rest of the colony. These guys live in desert areas from the Southwest and the, and the Central and Central America. And so during, in the desert, during hot parts of the day or during cold parts of the night or during uh, particular times of the year, certain times, Food may not be available, so these guys essentially serve as a food store during those times. The winter ant is an ant that occurs in the eastern United States that does something very similar, but unlike the replete that can't go back to being regular workers, these guys will extend their abdomen reversibly. So basically they'll go out and they'll scavenge for food. Both of these guys are scavengers, by the way, feeding on a number of different things, but these guys might go feed on flour nectar or something, and they'll engorge their abdomen and then they'll be able to keep that, uh, that food supply for a, an extended period of time, which they can feed to themselves and other workers. And then, of course, there are the so-called pest ants. Now, pest is a word that I think basically refers to um, um, insects that we don't want, or really any animal uh, or plants that we don't want in a particular area, and, uh, or it's like a nuisance or a health hazard or whatever. And even so-called pest ants, like these moisture ants over here, or carpenter ants can demonstrate some pretty cool um, uh, behaviors and they play extremely important roles in the environment. So Lassius over here, and there's a lot of them, and Lassius neoniger in particular is a very common ant. And both of these guys are actually well known for uh, farming aphids. So they, they'll go up or other um, sweet honeydew secreting insects like scale insects. They'll go up and they'll actually uh, keep aphids and scale insects like mealybugs safe on a plant and they'll they'll take their little sweet nectary honeydew solution secretion that they produce. And um, but beyond that, Halassius in particular when they dig their colonies, they really, they'll, they'll overturn soil and they what they do is they wind up providing aeration to soil and they provide a the grounds for other plants and other animals to take root in a particular area. So these guys are really important in shifting the ecology of a particular environment. Carpenter ants, even though everyone hates them, these guys will really, they like to live in damp wood. So usually wood that's already rotted, that's when they'll go and make their nests. And they don't eat wood, to be clear. They just kind of live in this rotten wood. They're taking advantage of a situation that's already present. And they're really important in forests for decomposition of decaying wood and plant material and recycling nutrients. And so bottom line is ants are really important members of all ecosystems that they can be found in. They're soil aerators, they're nutrient recyclers, they're herbivores feeding on different plant material, they're predators keeping uh, animal populations in check, and their colonies provide habitats for other species. So believe it or not, other types of insects and other animals will 
are, will have specialized on living in ant colonies, or the ants themselves will provide a reason or a place for these other species to survive. Ants are also pollinators and decomposers, feeding on uh, both flower nectar and in the process of transferring pollen, and also feeding on dead or decaying matter. And without them, these ants would be, uh, without them, ecosystems would be in serious disrepair. They're so important in the environment. And honestly, they're also just plain cool. 